or the right to refusal if it's something of that nature. Uh, opportunity zones. We all received an email from Eric um, with the map of the opportunity zones. Is, are you prepared to talk to us or do you want us just to take questions? Take this opportunity. Mr. Brooks is kind enough to, to fill in tonight for us. He's been working on this with his guide. I would simply say that you all could use most of what I just handed you as uh, source material because I'm going to go over uh, all of it. It has some case sites and some laws that are referenced in the uh, creation of an opportunity zone. Uh, I'm standing in the stead of uh, Eric Von Otteren. He is out on vacation and he has asked me to take a moment or two to explain or at least introduce the idea and concept. I'm going to hit some of the high spots of this, but if uh, if maps are good, I don't want you to see the detail, I just want you to see the numbers. Those are opportunities in the metro area that exist. And in the words of many uh, who are in economic development today, uh, opportunity zones, or the, if you fit the criteria, and unfortunately many areas within the Snell and within the CID now uh, fit the primary criteria. And what it does is it offers businesses, if this is so changed from what it was, uh, businesses who hire two additional employees and they pay those uh, two additional or more employees more than 23,163 uh, 23, I think, if they pay more than that and offer health insurance then they're eligible for $3,500 per employee state tax uh, benefit. In other words, they for each employee that business actually uh, receives a tax credit of $3,500 and it extends for five years. In the past it did not uh, uh, address, it was mostly manufacturing, industrial, those types of things. This time a, uh, uh, any retail establishment that you all bring in and I'll, for lack of a better example, uh, if this new Walmart store down here has 60 people and 40 of them make more than $23,000 a year, that business will get a $3,500 tax credit per employee that makes over that amount of money. It is a tremendous incentive for economic developers uh, where you had an old uh, redevelopment site, somebody comes in there, it's a new business, or the guy who's down here or the woman who's down here who takes their business and adds two or more employees, they are eligible for this, uh, this tax credit. The, the critical piece is that you all have to look at your city and, and say that uh, we need to revitalize here. And there's a presence of pervasive poverty, general distress, underdevelopment and blight. Uh, some people don't like those words, but when you look at the maps that came out in the 2010 census, you find that there are pockets of poverty where that poverty level exceeds 15%, which is the criteria in this case. Uh, and I don't want to get us too uh, far into high weeds, but, but it is a great opportunity for us to uh, look at who's eligible and whether or not uh, you all want to take the steps to ensure that. Uh, believe it or not, I do not know if you all already have an urban redevelopment uh, area here. That's one of the criteria. That is a threshold. But it is essential that where that urban redevelopment area is, is overlaid by the opportunity zone. So if you've got an opportunity zone over here, but the urban redevelopment uh, designation has not been made, then those two, two things don't uh, marry. But if you have that urban redevelopment 
or enterprise zone. Do y'all have enterprise zones? In that handout you have there, enterprise zone and how you establish that is, uh, is well defined there and certainly I'm able <laughs> to talk about how to do some of these things uh, if you'd like for me to. Uh, defining the boundaries. Uh, I think that Eric really had in mind two distinct areas and I think some of them were around your town center area. And just to the south uh, of, of uh, around Henry Flower, when you look at that, it does meet the poverty uh, requirement. If it is a census tract or a census block, did you know there was a census block? That's the pieces that it's broken down to inside. If they are adjacent to or across the street from one of these areas, then they're eligible to, uh, to become an opportunity zone. Eric did not specify what the boundaries are, but before we move forward inside the city of Snowville, certainly we want you all to be aware of what is going to be required of the city. There's a resolution that would have to be passed by the city in order to uh, have one declared here. Either enterprise zones or the urban redevelopment zones would have to be in place prior to us making the application, uh, assuming that we want to cooperate between the CID and the, the city. Uh, you all would have to pass that resolution in order to, to advance that. But the boundaries will have to be set based on the work that's to be done. Uh, we are looking at uh, three potential contractors right now, and the prices range from about $13,000 up to about $20,000 to do this work. And when you get very deep into it, you understand that there's a lot of statistical evaluation that's required to support this before it goes back to DCA. So you really have to look at the zones and look at where you all would propose to, to take one or create these zones and then look around it and see what those uh, maps look like. I actually enclosed a sample of a DCA map in, in with uh, what I did uh, early on and uh, you will find that, that the, the uh, flower area particularly, some of the areas south uh, by Cambridge McGee could easily become an opportunity zone at that location. Uh, and what kind of incentive, if you all got this passed, uh, everybody asked me about timelines, it will take us about six weeks to do the grunt work to get the statistics together to prepare a proposed application then get it into DCA. I've met with DCA already and it is very aggressive for us to be able to do this by the end of the year. But that has to be the target uh, to really benefit some of the things that you all have going on in the town right now. Uh, what I mean by that is we don't have to have this in <coughs> place when the jobs come here. But if it occurs within that tax year, if we get it done by December the 31st, new jobs that come into the town that are in that opportunity zone will be eligible for this tax credit. Uh, and so we intend to push uh, very hard. We've got a, a couple of consultants who really know their business in this regard. Uh, the application, we have a few friends, as I know you all do, who are on the DCA board that will help, help expedite uh, this process and when they told us on some roads that we'd be lucky to get a right-of-way acquisition by the end of uh, June, through the help of a lot of people, we were able to get that. <coughs> it can be done. It's just a very aggressive uh, schedule. Uh, what we would focus on here in Snell would be the places where you would designate, but specifically the town center area and Highway 124 at 78 intersection as potential. There may be some other place that, and it doesn't have to be within the CID. This is just a cooperative agreement between the, the uh, city and the, uh, as we uh, look at hiring someone between the city and, and the CID to uh, try to share the cost a little bit. Uh, 
uh, and then everybody says how much does that cost, we would propose that you all would contribute uh, $5,000. That is not a number that Eric has not already heard. Okay. Don't need a commitment. I'm here sort of in his stead tonight. Uh, so I would, uh, I would say that uh, as we look at what has to be done, certainly getting the uh, amendments together, getting the resolutions together, and getting the applications together, setting the boundaries, and trying to do that within six weeks is a very aggressive schedule. I don't know if you all have to approve uh, uh, this expenditure or if it's already budgeted in your economic development. I just don't know about the budgetary side. Uh, I would uh, I would offer now to answer any questions that you all have. Clarify for me and make sure you just understand this. The URA has to have a master plan already completed with these opportunity zones, kind of, you know, they're... If you, have, if you have a URA that's been established and it, it is in a specific location, those boundaries have been set, mm -hmm. uh, I, I have not read it well enough to know that a master plan is an absolute requirement for that. It but it has to be a designation excuse me. It requires a designation, but our URA is designated to cover our whole city. So we would be covered. We've already got the URA part complete. We would just need approval of council at this point in time to go forward with the resolution. There is probably, there's probably, I mean, what Mr. Rook's probably looking at is there, there's a plan requirement of a URA. It really doesn't have power until it does a plan. And, and this is just URA. It ain't got anything to do with opportunity zone, but it's 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 their responsibility to have an approved plan before they really have authority to move forward on it. Do they have that? Do we have that? Yes. Okay. I don't know. That was sort of last thing we were working on before. I just don't want to jump to the end and find out we didn't have the beginning. Right. And this process that 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 has been the sort of the. A key ingredient in economic development around the county and very effective in our cross. I mean, these tax credits are, are very valuable in, in terms of encouraging. So the URA needs the plan, mm -hmm. but, but that takes a bunch of statistical, uh, it's really population surveys and itemizing where your, your poverty area is in order to qualify. Scope and boundaries, those yeah. types of things. And the plan for the, and I haven't said, but to, if they've got one, they're great. If they're not, putting together a plan to meet the statutory requirements is not difficult. And, uh, and, and, and then it frees you to, that will not stop you from taking advantage of that process, even if we don't. You know. That's Mr. Brooks, the, the CID is doing this regardless of the city goes for it or not. Yeah. And y'all just came to us as an opportunity to kind of coattail on with you. It, it basically was a, uh, an outgrowth of the conversation that Eric and I had at a chamber meeting, and I told him what we were doing and that, that we were going to move forward very quickly. And uh, he said, what do you think about us trying to uh, move this forward together? And that was the germ of the idea as we tried to move it forward. So the CID will be offering these incentives, and the county is working on these incentives. So if we don't have them, we're kind of at an unlevel playing field because we can't offer these incentives to prospective businesses. Um, these are all federal? They're all state, sir. Great state. point. Thank you so much. It is, it is all state incentives. So it's a, it's a $3,500 credit on state income tax? Yes, sir. It, it will. It actually will go with your occupation tax, and from there it goes to your regular uh, income tax liability. So, if council would like to move forward, then we would need to put this on our next council agenda for a resolution. Yeah. So, we have a consensus to put it on. I think it's a good idea. That is. Thank you. Oh, Any other questions for Mr. Brooks? Um, community garden leaves, Mr. Powell. The 
y'all saw the form. It had not changed from the previous draft, and the uh, in, in what I got back from from the community garden were were in, in my email were two uh, issues. One was uh, the payment of utilities being an issue, and the other was the insurance policy that that's required. Um, it really didn't have anybody to talk to in terms of. Are, are those concessions that can be made, or does the city want to consider making those types of concessions? And, and the setup of the garden, the, the um, uh, utility payments, if it's if it's individual uh, uh, operation of garden, and and you're you're using water, uh, the water in the individual uh, area, then it, it, it can get very close to a gratuity. That that can be very difficult. To do um, the insurance policy, you know, that's one that uh, I, you know, I, I think it can be waived as far as the lease is concerned, uh, as long as the the sponsor of the community garden, which is staff, actually overrides. They have insurance already, and, and just combining that would probably be my suggestion. There is that you actually make sure that the staff policy is extended to to cover the community garden. So, and I didn't know of any other. Um, is there any extended liability in the community garden as opposed to somebody being out on the side of the um, city property in, in either case? Right. So is there a liability difference if I go out and play kick the can on the soccer field and hurt my foot or if I trip in the community garden? The, the, uh, when, when we get a, a third party in on, on, the, on the park, then, then you're 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 going to have a third party with liability, and so you're just trying to create a stop from having uh, coverage issues where our insurance company is going after our community garden group. <laughs> it's, it's a good idea to have but sure. all in. See, so this is the lease agreement that controls that use, so it's a good idea to have that policy. I think we need to investigate this a little further because um, we have no idea what utility costs are going to be and um, the rental agreements that the amount of rental we're talking about money over there probably I mean that probably so we can uh, the other side of that is if they're using the utilities I can't say it's a fee but I mean, something's got to be worked out so maybe uh, um, we just need to talk with the community garden people at length and, and find out a little bit more about what those expenses would run and then I have a couple things. Um, we talked about uh, any uh, changes, any improvements to the property would be the property of the community garden, uh, but if those are improvements like the fence that the city bought, then I would argue that those need to stay property of the city. I, I don't believe it was a good, I don't believe that the Improvements would become the property of the community garden and become the property of the city. Right. I think it says in here it becomes the property of the community garden. It, it should. It, it really should be the right. reverse. Right. Yeah. And, and the description, the description of the. This is my understanding of the description of the community garden. It wouldn't include the fence. The fence would be not right. part of the lease area. Right. It's my understanding. And I would just add, if they were going to be uh, permanent improvements other than like the garden beds, I know that they talked about erecting some other structures that those come in front of the mayor and council um, for consideration before they're erected. Also, um, default is only for failure to pay the, the $100 lease fee, but I would argue that default would be if it, they didn't comply with any of the terms and conditions of the lease, not just for failure to pay the $100. Okay. Anything else on the community gardens? Who signs this lease? Uh, staff would, is an actual lease with staff. That would be responsible for signing on behalf of the city. And the city's department. Yeah. Uh, monument signs, welcome signs, Councilman Sabah. Uh, I brought this last time um, from, uh, from the dais. The, we've been talking about signs uh, for uh, years before this new council was formed. Um, and, and I've, I've seen that the staff has done some great work on these monument signs. I think it's time to start utilizing these signs across in the city, at least get, get the boundaries from 78 
Rosebud or 124 doing that business, in that business district just simply to identify that. It, and no, no more than that. I mean, my home point was pretty, pretty small. I mean, I wasn't making a, a huge uh, uh, presentation about it by no means. Simply the signs that I think this was done by. This was done by. Everyone. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's it's the so quick and dirty sketch. Excuse me. It's the quick and dirty sketch. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think this is pretty. Uh, if we have something like that that it addresses the city. Uh, as you come in and, and leave the city, I think that'll be fantastic and putting one on both ends of the business district 124. So this is open for discussion. I don't have a preference of the color of this at this point. I'm, I'm probably colorblind to any of those. It's just uh, this is a team a team effort. If we can get it going, if we can get it established, if we can get it installed uh, for a, uh, a moderate amount of money without um, um, overspending and just do it once, do it right, and just identify the dollars. And, and off we go. That's all I want. How many of these are you talking about? How many of these do you want? One at 178 entrance. Your and point of information, and Mike, just a question. And How many one, of these do you want? And one at the other end of 78, one at 24 on one side. And one. I would rather have, I would rather have uh, uh, eight of them, but because of the money I propose, I don't think we can afford it. So, how many are you saying? Um, Right now, I'd like to do two at 124. Two at 124 and? And uh, two more at 78. So, total of four? Correct. And so, it, it, would be, it would be cool to have one on, on each side of the highway as you come in. Um, but I what think it makes sense. What are you proposing the open square, right? Well, the dimensions are on this right here. No, right here. What, what, what is this? Is, just, is, is this just blank? Yeah, this is the, the there was another one, there's one, another one in, in your, in your, in your uh, uh, family that looks a little different now. Right that uh, talks about welcome to Snapple. And if this can be an information si uh, uh, segment where we can put information about Snailville Day, he's coming to, to town, whatever we can use it. Do you propose to put these in the middle of the right of way? The middle of what do you mean by the middle of the right of way? I mean in the middle of the right of way or on one side of the other of the one street? Side, on one side of the, of the right side as you come in, into the city. And have we done right of way considerations on that yet? And that's just open discussion. That's all it is. We already own right of way. If we were to do new welcome signs, this is two different things. This is monument sign, location signs, and it's welcome signs. We already have the welcome sign right away on Highway 78. Uh, that would not require any purchase. That we could replace it with an updated welcome sign. Uh, the monument signs, uh, the smaller version, we would have to do right away acquisition. Uh, we do have, depending on um, depending on the location, we do have some right away acquisition for sidewalks um, and for easy have an easement for utilities, uh, so it depends on the actual size of the monument sign um, as to whether we have to have any additional right-of-ways, uh, whether it was on the state route road, we have to get permission of the uh, Georgia DOT or the Gwinnett DOT. Um, but I think it's about the design just to get, if there's any consensus to go forward with it, or if it's something council doesn't want to do, then we can drop it tonight. I, I just think we need a lot more information. That, that we have no idea the size of the you know, the cost, whether that's a final design. I mean, I, I think that before, uh, I certainly agree that you should, if you should be able to go forward and get enough information to get a okay. council, so the council can make a decision, but there's certainly not enough information available. This, this absolutely, I appreciate it, uh, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, I, I will work with, uh, with the planning department on that and see what we can do. I mean, simply get an idea of where these things can, and go and essentially, bottom line is find out how many people we can afford and and what we don't know. What, yeah, really, and what, that's my point. We need to find out. So, so once we get you know we get all these questions answered, this may require a couple months worth of work. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not an overnight thing. I just want to make sure that this is no secret. It's coming up in front of everybody. It's secret two weeks ago. It's I said this is. <laughs> all right, we're getting out of time, so we're going to move on. Uh, Lisa. The park bathroom that was damaged. Do we know what the final cost is for the repairs? We haven't. We did the uh, toilet repair. We're just down to the, you know, get rid of the soot and 
we change them on all that, but it looks like with that, we'll probably be around 800. So is it something that we've handled in-house as far as repairs, or is it something we're going to report to insurance? Um, I got with Melissa, and we're going to try to add the other vandalism, even though they're on different days, and I doubt it will go, but individually, none of them will hit our $1,000 deductible. Um, so at this point, I, that's why we went forward because it was also the handicap stall and so I didn't really want to leave that not repaired. So I don't think we'll, the answer is I don't think we'll be able to put it under insurance just because it won't re reach the deductible. Does anybody have any questions about the restroom repairs? I mean, if, it's, if it's clear it's going to be less than $1,000, we just need to fix it. No, it is fixed. Okay. The, the toilet itself is fixed and usable. We just need to do some of it. We did that first. Okay. The rest of it is painting and scraping the plastic off. Uh, use of Baker's Rock property. We, you all should receive a memo from Lisa. Uh, we have Karen Davis is here who represents the, the group, and so I didn't know if, after reading the information that was sent forward, if you have any questions, she certainly could answer them a little better than I could as far as the use of the property and what they're looking to do. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any questions? I think it's a great opportunity. The only thing I would question them how to make sure that the uh, insurance. We have insurance as we as we put up. Uh, just sitting there now, just be putting it to use for other people. Uh, well, I'd recommend we do the same, <coughs> form, same format as the community garden in terms of having a formal lease arrangement where you know how to exit the relationship and all the responsibilities of liabilities spelled out for everybody. Yeah, it needs to be a lease agreement. Mm -hmm. And as everybody, I think from their standpoint, because the repairs that need to be done to the house and the property itself, they really kind of want to move forward because they really can't utilize the property until they do some repairs. So is it something that we, we can continue moving forward on? I guess that's really my biggest question. Yeah. I don't think yeah. they should start repairing until we have a lease. No, <laughs> no, I realize that. That's what I'm saying. Are we going to move forward with the lease? Because I haven't told them yes or no because I knew it had to come before lease like approval. If council's in agreement, then if Tony could grab something and have it on our next agenda, and then we'll discuss approval, we'll discuss the specifics. Just in terms of timing, is there a time period where if you had another use for that piece of property, you want to give them to terminate their relationship? Somebody came 60 with days, the money 180 the days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or the, or the property is surrounded. Is there, is there some instruction on that? What's, what's a reasonable time frame for something like that? How much time do you want to get the road? <laughs> well, we were open to hold on to it for as long as possible because I think we're probably one of the few organizations that can respect the fact that it is, you know, it has been declared by the Department of Natural Resources as an endangered ecosystem. And we can protect that in addition to. Um, so, yeah. This isn't eventuality. I don't think anybody would come along with pockets. No, I mean, our, our, basically our goals are very similar to those that were originally um, conceptualized by the city when they purchased the property. Um, we're, just, we're just adding a piece to it in order to help facilitate mm -hmm. that piece of it. What term are you looking for as far as your lease agreement? What would you be? Uh, initially a year at a, at a minimum. And so I think as far as termination, though, you have to think of the other party. If somebody were to come and make us an offer, how long would they be willing to, to wait? Usually due diligence is about 60 to 90 days for a party making us an offer. Yeah. So if you had 90 days after the year, you know, it could win, you would be 90 days in the first year, is that what you're saying? Just want to make sure you clear that. Or would it be a one-year lease and then <laughs> renewable after that with 90 days notice? If we, or, want to put, we can put a termination clause. It depends on what we want to do. Do we want to put well, a termination I mean, the, the, clause in there, or do I, we want to? Looking at it from their point of view, they don't want to go invest money in the six months from now. We tell them, okay, you got 90 days. I think we need to give them a guarantee because they are going to make an investment. So if we gave them, you know, one year to guarantee, and then after that one year, you would the, the, it would have a clause that said, within if we get, if someone came to us that we had to do something with property, we would have to give you a 90 days notice to vacate the property. Would that be something we'd be that we have had ample time to. That's why I'm asking if 90 days is ample. 
Um, and that's the individuality I mean, that somebody want to does be come back. Well, I really, I think that it would probably be best that I uh, discuss this with our our okay. attorney was supposed to be here today, and unfortunately she got tied up. She's with the legislature. Why don't we're, we're running out of time? Is everybody in agreement? This is something we want to work on. Yeah. Tony, if you can get the contact information, and Doug could try to find something okay. out and bring it back to council. Okay. We'll discuss it at our next meeting. Um, is there anything else on the work session agenda that can't be postponed until the next meeting that we need? Cherish council members is pretty high up in my priority. <laughs> well, we always talk, we always joke about it, so I, I printed out some prices. They're about $170 if we want to get new chairs, so we're not all caught in there. So those chairs are a little large. Um, if it's not something we seriously want to do, then we don't have to go any further, but if we do, okay. that's what's going to cost us about. Um, anything else that's jumping out at us to talk about tonight that can't get postponed to the next council meeting? So, no, 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 no. Right, we'll adjourn and we can do it in about two minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.